Okay, um, let's, let's get started on some of the notes then. We'll, we'll go through some things today. Now, a lot of what I'll say today is historical in nature. Uh, so just title your notes, Intertestamental Period. All right, so... Okay, what does intertestamental do? That deals with the, the time in between, th that your mind rests in between tests. So you intertestamental. So this is that time right there. And ah in the Greek means not. So there's no mental activity in between tests. So this is what intertestamental means. So, I mean, it's obvious. I don't have to really put any of that. You should know that. Okay, so this is the time in between testaments. Basically from about 405 B.C., until about four, when John the Baptist started preaching, before BC or so, approximately or pretty close, actually almost exactly 400 year, uh, 400 year uh, time period. This uh, ended the Book of Malachi. Okay, so the Book of Malachi or Malachi, if you will. There you go. Is uh, was the last Old Testament book, and then when John the Baptist started preaching in the wilderness there. That's the time period that we're talking about. Now, what is characteristic about these two time periods? What, what is a characteristic of it? Well, God's word was not being dispensed, all right? So we, we talk about the word dispensation. You've heard of that before, okay? It's basically time periods when God either gave us his word or revealed something about himself or something about what was going to happen, some kind of prophetical statement, something that was, uh, he's, he's dispensing for, he's giving us his word. <clears throat> Throughout the history of man, you can look at man's history in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways you can look at it were the times in, in history where God gave us some of his thoughts, whether through prophets or, or uh, in the last days, according to his son. Hebrews chapter 1, it says that God, in diverse manners and in sundry manners and diverse times, I think it says, gave to us his word through the prophets, I'm paraphrasing, but now has given, to us through, given his word to us through his son. So the transmission of the Bible to us is really very interesting. God did it, did it in a number of different ways. The book of Revelation, for example, went from God gave it to an angel who gave it to John, who gave it to the churches. So in the book of Revelation, this is the, the way that God's word was transmitted. All right, uh, in the New Testament, of course, God being Christ himself, uh, gave it to the apostles who gave it to the churches. Okay, so John, of course, being an apostle, but there's this inter intermediary uh, angel for the book of Revelation. It was slightly different. But he have, where it says sundry times in diverse manners, that's true. Lots of different ways God did that. Sometimes he spoke directly to a prophet. The prophet gave it to God's people. So in lots of different ways and in lots of different time periods. It says in, in different times. All right, so those periods of time where he did give us his word is his dispensation. He dispensed unto the world his thoughts, his information. Okay, so the way that we receive the Bible, and God chose different ways to do it. He spoke through a donkey, okay, so we could put here a donkey to the prophet, to man, okay, so we can put that. So uh, lots of different ways that God did it. Uh, sometimes the angel spoke things directly. And, uh, but, but it's given, certainly the New Testament is, one, th one of the things for sure is that all of it's given to the churches. All right. So um, none of God's word in the New Testament was given other than through a church. All right. So um, this is that transmission. Anyway, we're talking about, this is dispensation. <clears throat> so from 405 B.C. to 4 B.C. is an intertestamental period. No kind of dispensation during this time. Uh, what is significant about Old and New Testament? Well, a lot is significant, okay? In the Old Testament, uh, they worshipped in a temple. They had, it was Judaism, okay? That was the primary religion. Uh, the New Testament is not Judaism. It's the church, of course. And uh, God made a very, very strong and direct statement that he is no longer putting his staff of approval on Judaism, but on the church with the destruction of the temple. Without a temple, there's no Judaism, okay? You can't have it. The temple is, is necessary. Their, their religion was, was indelibly tied to a temple. You had to have it. So without the temple, there was no. So without a temple, God was saying, well, it's not Judaism anymore. It's the church. Now that's going to be reversed for the book of Revelation. One day, the world will revert back to Judaism. At any rate, um, 
I digress. So we're talking about this intertestamental period. It, it is a period of time where God did not give us his word. However, a lot happened during that time. A lot happened. There are some apocryphal books called the Maccabees. It's first and second Maccabees, and you'll hear that name again in just a minute. But those are historical books, and they describe some of the events that happened in the intertestamental period. Uh, Maccabee means uh, hammer. Okay, so Judas Maccabee was, he's, that's what the word Maccabee means. Actually, that wasn't his, that was his, his uh, I don't want to say nickname, but title. And those are one of the three sons of Mattathias. Okay, so one of the big things that happened in this intertestamental period is that uh, the Greeks and the Romans, of course, all of those uh, nations were, rose to power uh, during this, this time. Right, the Babylonians, we see that at the end of the Old Testament, so not that. But the Medo-Persians, we see a little bit of that. But the Greek and Roman time, certainly the Greek uh, period of history where they rose to prominence, is exclusively an inter intertestamental period. And then Rome, we see, of course, is uh, still master over the world uh, during when Christ came. But the Greeks. So the Greeks tried to force uh, people to obey their pantheistic religion. So they had a lot of gods, all right? The Greek word pan means many, okay? And so theos is God, so what does pantheos mean? It's many gods. So they had, as opposed to monotheistic, they were pantheistic. So they tried to get the world to follow their religious system of pantheism, which for most religions during that time probably wasn't a big deal except for one, Judaism. Okay, they were monotheistic, and they were clearly told in God's word not to bow down to uh, idols or images, and that's very, very strong. If you know anything at all about the Old Testament, you know that was a big, big, big problem uh, that the Jews had through all time, and, and it's something that God very forcibly told them not to do. So the G Greeks... The geeks. I <laughs> said the geeks. <laughs> the Greeks said, uh, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, so they, they wanted to get people to obey their religion. So there's a town of Modin, actually. It's just a little town. Uh, they would have t shirts that said, Where in the world is Modin? Undoubtedly, because it was just a tinky little town. <laughs> Only it would be in Hebrew. Ach, 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 Modin. Whatever. Okay, so. <laughs> Um, so in Modin, there is a priest there by the name of Mattathias. You probably know that the priests took cycles where they would go and serve in the temple and then they would go back home and that sort of thing. So there was a priest, Mattathias, and he was back home in Modin. There, the Greeks tried to get Mattathias, being a priest, to offer a pig, swine, if you will, puerco on the altar there, which was not supposed to be done. I don't know why I keep looking up here telling, because I'm trying to remind myself <laughs> what we're talking about, I guess. But in Mattathias was his name, which interestingly enough is the name of Josephus' his name is Mattathias, and he's a Jewish historian. There's a different Mattathias, and they tried to get him to do it. Well, he refused, <clears throat> and so another Jew stepped in and was going to do it. So Mattathias, full of religious fervor, decided that he didn't want that to happen. He killed the Jewish man that was going to sacrifice that altar. Then the Greeks weren't really happy about that, as you can imagine. So then he also took care of some of them. Then he ran with his three sons, John, Simon, and Judas, into the uh, wilderness, as it were, and carried out guerrilla warfare operations against the Greeks and were actually successful. And so the book of, and so then, um, at least somewhat successful, not ultimately successful, but somewhat they were. And then, toward the end, um, the, all of them ended up dying. But you may have heard of the Hasmodean dynasty. Well, that's the Maccabees. Or it's, it's one and the same. So if you hear the word Hasmodean dynasty or Maccabees is what we're talking about. So this is during the intertestamental period. All this is happening. The, the uh, worldly uh, Distaste, if you will, for the Jewish people is, is, is mounting and mounting and mounting. They were the fundamentalists of the ancient world. I guess you could look at it that way. And so they were, they were persecuted. There were times where there was peace, but there was persecution. And this, so that this is what the Jews were, the, the only ancient civilization, really, that any of that would have really mattered for. So this is what's going on here. All of this, I say all of this during this class time, is because we're, it's leading up to the New Testament. It's preparing the world for the coming of Christ. In Galatians 4.4, 4, it says that, um, that, um, that uh, hello, uh, let me just look it up here. Galatians 4.4, 4. hopefully I have the reference right. 
that says, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. When the fullness of the time was come. So that marks years. That's a date. So God had a benchmark date of when, his, when Christ was going to come and be born. He, he knew it was going to happen. So, so don't you suppose that God was orchestrating things throughout history to bring that about, even from creation? Uh, Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium, where he's talking about the head crusher, and he's talking about uh, the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent. Since that very time, there was a promised seed that was going to come and destroy evil in the world. Well, God orchestrated all of that so that he could, he could make it happen. So um, it was important. So I guess what I'm saying is you can look at all of history that way. All of history could be really a sum of God orchestrating things. Now, whatever God says he's going to do, he can make it happen. So I might tell you I'm going to be in time for... <laughs> don't egg me on. I'm going to be... Mm -mm. Okay, so... He might say, uh, I might tell you, okay, I'm going to be on time every class time this next semester. But things happen. I get sick maybe or whatever. Obviously, that never happens with God. So whenever he says something, not only is he not a liar, he is omnipotent so he can make it happen. So what's our answer to how all of history? Because God made it happen. He made his promise of the promised seed happen throughout history. And all the things that happen, Mattathias and Moden and all of that may have not seen their... Okay, who is that, Lindsay? That's Lindsay, isn't it? Bless her heart. <laughs> you want to take care of it? Thank you. So, um, yeah, so God, God can make all, all of that happen. So this is also known as the intertestamental period is also known as the silent years. Okay, and this is because no, none of God, now I feel like I'm speaking really loud, that none of God's word was dispensed during that time. However, I think that maybe I've shown you that a lot of other things were happening. And really, it's an amazing thought to me how everything, everything fell into place. Maybe Satan thought that he was disrupting the course of history to destroy the seed, but really he just fell into God's plan, fell into his hand. And so it's an amazing thing. And we, could look, we have the benefit of looking back on hundreds and hundreds of years of history and see exactly how, get, how, how get the, God did those things. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about, about that. So really, uh, I said it was a period of 400 years. Okay. Now, had the Jewish people received God's word, his message through his prophets? They did not. Look at Jeremiah uh, verse, uh, chapter 6. A lot of different verses could have been, or portions of Scripture could have been chosen to show this, but I like this one because it's so very uh, distinct. Jeremiah 6.10. Now I'll read down through verse 19. Okay, so what are we showing here? Did the Jewish people accept God's word? You're going to see... Uh, that they did not. Okay, so keep that in mind when we read this. Verse 10. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. So how did they receive the word of God as a reproach? What does that mean? Well, they didn't like it. It was a reproach to them. It showed them how they were wrong. They didn't like it. Uh... I know that word reproach is here somewhere. Yep, there it is. They have no delight in it. So it's a reproach to them. They didn't have delight in it. Therefore, God says, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the age with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned into unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. A word about these few verses. This really harkens all the way up until the, the last days, the day of the Lord and the end times. Uh, this is when, uh, when Matthew 24, Matthew 25, Christ is talking about two people in the, being in the field, one taken, the other one left. That is, not, that is not talking about the rapture. It's not dealing with the church. He's talking about God's judgment. And the people that are taken in judgment are... Um, 
unfortunate. Okay, that's, that's a bad thing. So to be left on the earth afterwards is a good thing. To be taken is a bad thing. If we look at it as a rapture, the opposite is true, isn't it? To be taken would be a good thing. To be left would be a bad thing. So the way that you interpret Matthew 24 and 25 makes all the difference. Uh, all the difference. So here's a reiteration of that here in Jeremiah chapter 6. So he's talking about that. And he's talking about judgment, isn't he? And the judgment was specifically because they found his word of reproach and they didn't have any delight in it. Uh, verse 13, For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one is given to covetousness. Wow, could we describe our times? And from the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Interesting. This is dealing with those last times. There are going to be many prophets, Christ said, many prophets. So in the last days, there are many would-be uh, saviors will, will um, surface, as it were. And it says their, their, their point is going to be to alleviate the, the God's judgment and these vile judgments and sealed judgments is going to be to alleviate it, but they're only going to alleviate it slightly. And they're saying peace, peace, and there is no peace. When God, when rather they should have been repenting, they're going to seek for peace in all of it. Like, and we see that through Revelation. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. 16, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see. And ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk there. And this is God's word, isn't it? Where do they find the old paths to walk into? It's God's word. God's word that was preserved for us. A uh, fancy uh, theological word is inscripturated. Here it is for us. The way that the prophets and the, and the apostles were given God's word to give to us, we have it here. It's preserved for us. But that very preserved word, they, it was a reproach. They had no delight in it at all. So as a result, they became covetous. They filled um, the void of God's word with other things in the world. Also, verse 17, I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. So they stiffened their neck, didn't they? We will not do this. No, we're not going to do it. It's very simple. Very simple rebellion is what I'm saying. It's just direct rebellion, I should say. 18, Therefore, hear ye nations. God deals with nations. Doesn't he? he doesn't deal with the world as a whole. He deals with nations. Obviously, the world is comprised of nations, but he deals with each nation. And so God is national. He is nationalistic. Okay? This idea of global economy and one world money, religion, language is not the way God deals with things. So he, he deals with nations. And know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words. So the Jewish people who were to have received God's word and copied it and used it, Romans chapter 3 tells us that they were the God-ordained keepers of God's words. Unto them were committed the oracles of God, Paul says in Romans chapter 3, I believe, 10 and 11. And so he says, unto them were committed the oracles of God. You might, you might be asked, why did God have a people? Why did he have the Jews? Well, obviously the, the seed of Messiah was going to come through that seed. But also, God's word was brought through them. So they were to not only write it down, but hearken to it. But they did not. And so, this intertestamental period could be God saying, okay, well, if you don't want to listen, then you're not going to hear anything. However, they did have the promise at the end of Malachi of the ministry of Elijah was going to come again. It's given to us in Malachi. We'll look at that in a minute. Actually, we'll look at it right now, okay? So the beginning of this period of intertestamental would be the end of the book of Malachi. All right, so some things that's important to know. Again, we're reviewing all of this thing because it's the way that we're going to begin the study of the New Testament or the survey. But Malachi 4, this is the beginning of the intertestament period. He says in verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Okay, so God here through the prophet Malachi is giving us a benchmark, something that's going to happen that we're going to know. And what is it? Well, the sending, this sending of an Elijah or Elijah, the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, that's the end times. So before the end times begin, Elijah will be sent. Okay, this is what he said. So, 
through Malachi then, and this, there's a lot of theology involved in these two verses, but suffice to say that Malachi teaches us that there's going to be a prophet that's going to come. Now we know, because Christ designated who that prophet was, it was, it was John the Baptist. And his ministry was supposed to do what verse 6 says. Okay, what does verse 6 say? He, will, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Okay, smiting the earth with a curse, the great and dreadful day of the Lord is talking about the same time period. What is this idea of turning the heart of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers? This has to do with, Jew, with the Jews, okay? The Jewish people, the Israeli nation. He says in verse 4, he has unto Horeb and for all Israel. So he's talking to that. Obviously, the prophetic prophets were speaking to Israel. And so among the is, is Jewish people was to come a prophet. And that prophet was going to prepare the way, as it were, for the, for the, the fathers to turn their hearts to the children and children to the fathers. What that means is this. What the Jewish fathers, you could say, um, or, or those before, awaited for. But they, they waited for that promise. They looked for the coming of something. And uh, they had fallen away. Okay? And so the children of those that came afterwards then were to be turned towards that, turned towards the promise of, of the people beforehand. In other words, ultimately, what we're saying is all the promises that God gave to the Jewish people will be fulfilled when this Elijah the prophet comes. Okay. There, we see that? Is that, is that it's going to be fulfilled, right? all of those things. The promise was given to the fathers. The children were to receive that promise. Okay, this is the idea. Now, here, did that happen? Okay, now the, quite, the big question is this. We know that John the Baptist was that Elijah the prophet. Christ himself tells us that. This is, this is Elijah. If you, he says in Matthew eleven fourteen, if if conditional. Let's go there. Matthew eleven fourteen. Okay, look at verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until the kingdom of heaven, excuse me, until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Here it is. Look at verse, oh, okay, 13. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. Okay, so before him, right? So this is what it's saying. And so I was talking about the Old Testament. Then look at verse 14. And if ye will receive it, is that conditional? What is it? Epidosis, diaphysis, isn't that the, those statements? It's if and if and when thing, I think that's what it is. Um, so if you will receive, it's conditional. This is Elias which was for to come. He that hath the ears, let him hear. Okay, so John the Baptist was to be Elijah. That was God's plan. He was the Elijah of Malachi. Okay, Christ tells us that himself. But Christ makes it conditional. Because you might say to yourself, okay, well, it also says in Malachi that one John, once John the Baptist comes, then, of course, the end times will happen. Well, nothing in the book of Revelation seems to fit that, that has happened so far. So what's the problem? Well, here Christ tells us. By the way, this is only in the book of Matthew. He says, if you will receive it. If you will receive him. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which is for to come. The heart of the children that day were not, was not turned towards the fathers. The people in, G, in John the Baptist's day... Uh, did the uh, Jewish nation as a whole, remember God deals with nations, did they turn towards Christ through the preaching of John the Baptist? Yes or no? It should be very easy. So the nation of Israel as a whole turned turn towards by the, the preaching of John the Baptist? Absolutely not. So it didn't complete the, the prophecy of Malachi. We assume that when Christ comes again, of course, he will, he will complete it. So it was contingent upon the Jewish people receiving that message. The prophet Malachi prophesied and told of the coming of Elijah, but it was contingent upon the Jewish people. Jesus himself says, if you will receive it. So it was contingent upon that. Because the Jewish people did not, then, that, then the, the end times and all of that, of course, didn't happen. It didn't, it didn't come. So right now we're in this, um, the, man, people call it a lot of different things, but, it's, but it was God's plan to go ahead and fulfill all of those things with the coming of John the Baptist. That was his plan. But it's a contingent upon the belief of the, of the Jewish people. Because they rejected it, God has, has allowed time to expand. It's like an accordion. So right now, during, we're living in that time. And so you might, want, you might say to yourself, well, if they had accepted, then I wouldn't be here. 
Well, that's true, probably, but you wouldn't know that you weren't here. <laughs> so it wouldn't make a difference to you. But uh, God, in his mercy, has allowed people to be saved. It is, it, you realize that if tomorrow happens, if the next hour happens, it's only because of God's mercy. At any time, he could begin that judgment cycle. So any minute that you live is the mercy of God, really. Maybe not towards so much towards saved people, but towards an unsaved world, really. And so we're just living in, um, in a time period of God's mercy, really. That's all it is. And it says that very clearly in Second Peter. So um, the, that he is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. He's not slack. It's just that he's allowing it so that people will get saved. So that, and it was because the Jews rejected it. That's why. And so then he turned his attention towards the church. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in the book of Matthew, that's where we get this idea of the church. We have in Matthew chapter 16, the beginning of the church and all of that. So that, that fits in to the fact that Israel did, did, uh, didn't believe and accept the preaching of John the Baptist as a nation. Okay, so now we have this time period. And this time period, when is it going to end? We don't know. It's like an accordion. It's expanding, right? It's going out, off and out and out. So we're waiting for that to end. So that's, this is where, so in comes, so in the, in, in the meantime... What did the Lord give us through his son? The New Testament. We have the church age. We have all this ending of the silent years. And we know that the benchmark date for the beginning of all of that is going to be, it's going to be the rapture. Okay? So a lot, a lot happened and a lot didn't happen. Okay? The Lord never forces anybody to get saved. And so uh, he came up with all of this plan. It's all a result of that. Okay, and again, this is, told, this is given to us in, in uh, the book of Matthew. Okay, so the end of this time period was the prediction of uh, the birth of John the Baptist. This is where finally the Lord uh, announced things and he decided that he was going to turn back towards his people. Now, it's important to know, too, that God's intention was for the end times and all of that, all that was prophesied in Jeremiah that we just read and all of those things were to have been when John the Baptist came. Because the Jewish people rejected it, that time has been expanded. Had they accepted it, what would have happened? Well, everything that we see in Malachi and the millennium would have been actually long gone. It would have all happened already. But it didn't. It's kind of incredible to think of it that way. So although, he, although the Lord was silent during this time, uh, again, he's probably silent during these years, just like he's, uh, I say silent, not really silent, but he's not uh, performing those things. We're, by the way, we're in a dispensation right now where God's word is not being given to us. It's already given to us. It's a completion of the canon. Uh, we know that through, through a lot of different things, but um, we're not going to receive any more of it. That's, that's the end of it. We have it all. So let's talk a little bit about, um, okay, so that's uh, sort of an introduction. Most of uh, what the Lord did through history, he was preparing the world for the coming of the Messiah. And of course, John the Baptist was to be the forerunner of that. Uh, all right, enough said there. So all of, all of history can be, can be really uh, reflected on that way. All right, now let's talk about a description of the geographical activity. Okay, some of the things that happened in the world during this, during, during, during this time. Okay, so we'll, I just have seven points here, and we'll, we'll finish after this, and I'll just describe some things here, and we'll be done. Okay, the description of geographical activity in this time, essentially Palestine, really all of uh, the Old Testament prophecy prophesies around and centralized in that location in Israel. And so is the time now, and so is the world now. So everything's kind of focused that way. But we know that after the Babylonians... Uh, after they ruled the world came the Persians. Okay, so let's give, uh, so number one, the, the Persians uh, ruled, they were, they ruled the world at this time, or, or at, that, at a time during this, during this time. And they ruled from 539 to 331, okay? So first of all, we see the Persians. To 331, B.C., so you have to go backwards, right? All right, so the, those are Persian rule. So we see Cyrus. Um, so that's one of the kings, and uh, your Darius kings, and all of that. Okay, so that was the, during the Persian rule. Right after the, uh, the Persians then were defeated by the Greeks. The Greeks ruled twenty three B.C. Okay, these are the Greeks. 
Okay. Um, very interesting. Uh, very interesting history. You'd almost think that the Lord was decided he was going to write the New Testament in the Greek language and made everything happen for the Greeks that way. Uh, the region that is uh, Greece right now, in that area, in ancient times, Philip of Macedon. <clears throat> the reason why it's called that is because there was a region called Ma Macedon. Okay? And you read, you, you've heard a lot of these names probably, and if you've looked at any kind of uh, Greek history, and a lot of the... Uh, uh, Homer's Iliad is based on some of those regions. But you have, uh, this is, Ma Macedon was here. And I think you had a region here called Thrace. Down here was Sparta. You've heard of Sparta, right? The Spartans. This is Sparta. And then you had, I, I believe, the Athenians here. I don't remember exactly here. But suffice to say, Macedon, this, this region right here, was surrounded by other nations. And during the time of the Philip, of Macedon. They were being crushed, all right? They were, they were being kind of squeezed, cut off. There wasn't a very, this is a region of the world there was not very much of a water supply. And so uh, they, they, the Thracians were, were taking this over. Sparta was, uh, is, uh, kind of borders the ocean down here. And so Macedon was becoming smaller and smaller. They were taking more territory and more territory. And so a lot of, uh, it became small, almost to the point to, be, to become extinct. Then Philip of Macedon, uh, he decided to make some, uh, some deals, and he was very shrewd in his dealings with nations and things, and so he used some of his resources and things and made a deal with the Thracians and uh, I think with the Athenians and the Greeks and with the Spartans, and so they, in change, gave him some land. So he started to expand, and he actually had a plan to take over this entire region. So Macedon started to grow in power. They spoke uh, the Greek language. Okay, ancient Greek. So Philip of Macedon had a, had a, had a uh, plan to do that. However, he died early. It was then left up to his son to fulfill that plan. You may have heard of him. Alexander the Great was the son of Philip of Macedon. He essentially took uh, his dad's plan to expand the borders there and actually took it a uh, step further into world conquest uh, after his dad did. His dad passed away, so he took up the mantle, mantle if you will. Um, do you know what his personal tutor was, Alexander the Great? You may have heard of Aristotle. Okay, so Aristotle was his personal tutor. Now, Aristotle's tutor, you know who that was? Plato. Plato, yes, Plato, Plato which means plate in Spanish, right? Okay. Is it Platino? His name? Platino, right? I think so. Something like that. Anyway, uh, it gets confused in Spanish. But so uh, th this is uh, Plato. So Plato and Aristotle had a difference, really. I'm not going to get into phil philosophy, but Plato believed in the forms. He believed that uh, you kind of looked up this way. And Aristotle said, no, it's not so much that. It's what we do. So he was more spiritual in nature. He was more physical in nature. Well, Alexander the Great, now the reason why that's important is because, of course, Alexander the Great was tutored by Aristotle. So he received the philosophy of being the best that you can be, not so much uh, dependence on what he called the forms. Okay? So it's interesting philosophy. At any rate, <clears throat> so Aristotle's teaching really forged this person, Alexander the Great, gave him the... Uh, belief that he could uh, take over uh, or to do great things and eventually he, he used that to take over the world at the time. So it was Alexander the Great. However, Macedon then went from the, the brink of extinction to becoming absolutely the world power through Alexander the Great. Again, all of that um, was allowed, orchestrated, you could say, by the Lord. And I would think because he's going to give his word one day in the Grecian language. You say so. He's he, he orchestrated all of history so that he can write the Bible in, his, in a language? Yeah, why is that so unfounded? What's more, is, is God's word important to him? Yeah, <laughs> he's forged, sure. So I believe that. Anyway, that came about. That's, that's a little bit of the Greek history there. <clears throat> and the Greeks, during this time, you notice it's a very short time period. Alexander the Great uh, died very early, and then his 
kingdom was divided between his uh, generals, uh, Cassander, Seleucid, Ptolemy, and Cassamicus, or Cassam, I think that's right. Uh, no, Cassander, Ptolemy, Seleucid, and there's another guy in there too, I forget his name, always one short. Anyway, there's four generals. This is all described to us in the book of Daniel. All right, then, uh, then the, the, so we're talking about the region of Palestine. So during this, the, this period uh, where his generals uh, kind of divided the world up at the time, the region of Palestine was underneath different generals. Okay, sometimes the Ptolemies ruled, and these, these would be Ptolemy was a general, and he had the Egyptian part of the world. And then sometimes it was underneath the rule of the Seleucids. Seleucidas, uh, I believe, was the name of uh, the general. And so he was to the north. He was more of the region of Syria and up to the, up to the north in that region. So the uh, Mediterranean Sea is here. The land of Palestine is here. Seleucid region is up here. Ptolemy is down here. Ptolemies wanted to take over the world. Seleucids wanted to take over the world. Then the Ptolemies wanted to. And then the Seleucids wanted to. Well, who's caught in the middle? The land of Palestine. So in comes Daniel chapter 11, which describes to us all of this uh, history between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, including, including Cleopatra, who's named for us the daughter of women in the Bible there. So, um, and, and notice the exact replica of the map there. I shouldn't have to tell you what those regions are, because that's exactly what it looks like. Okay, so then that's why we say sometimes the Ptolemies, sometimes the Seleucids, there aren't really any... Uh, Real firm dates here because it, it, it switched hands so much. <clears throat> but they certainly did rule the, the region of Palestine for a while. So the solution. So that was a time period where this uh, area went through, switched hands a lot. Well, you may know that armies travel on roads. That's something. And back then, of course, infantry meant something. You actually walked everywhere. <coughs> and uh, so the infantry units would go through here. At any rate, through this land and through this region, became very, very distinct and defined pathways through there. Not to mention that region is very mountainous, and so because of the mountainous terrain, there was only certain ways to go through there, and it became very, very distinct. Also, the uh, population would be congregated around bodies of water. Obviously, you need water to survive. That's even true today, as is evidence in Texas, right? You have to have water. So they have to have some kind of water source, whether it's brought in, or whether it's a natural spring, or whether it's whatever. They have to have a water source. So the population would be concentrated around these water sources. So uh, by the time Christ came along, and, and especially the beginning of the church in Paul's time, these roads were all, all already very, very, very uh, distinct. And the regions and, and the pathways between mountains and things. And so he would give the parable of the Good Samaritan, and people understood that because they traveled through the land. And so the, you can see the world, even the geography, even the, the place was, was being... Uh, prepared for us, or for that time. Okay, then... Okay, there was a uh, Seleucid, 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 Seleucid king by the name of uh, Antiochus the Sixth. The sixth. More historically known as Antiochus Epiphanes. And so this is, uh, by the way, Epiphanes comes from two, this shows you the pride, pride of him. This comes from two Greek words, epi, which means above, and phanos, which means manifestation. So what does Antiochus Epiphanes mean? Antiochus, the manifestation from above. <laughs> That's prideful. Of course, these people were involved in uh, imperial worship, and they would actually worship these men as gods, Caesars and so forth. But he named himself Epiphanes. I don't know if he named himself, but somebody did. Probably named himself. He is the manifestation of us. So we might, we might use this sometimes, like, that was an epiphany when you have an incredible thought, and you don't want to attribute it to yourself, and you're trying to be modest, although in truth you're really not. But it's, a, it's a Epiphanes. It's a manifestation from above. Okay, So phanos is manifestation epi above. You've heard of a Christophany, that's a manifestation of Christ, so it's the same idea. Okay, so Antiochus VI. Now, this, this, uh, the abomination of desolation uh, of the Antichrist is pictured by what Antiochus uh, Epiphanes did in one of his journeys through the Promised Land. He offered a, a 
pig on the altar there, the temple. And so uh, when <clears throat> that is going to happen, now that's just a picture of what the Antichrist is going to do, but the Antichrist one day is going to do that, and that's going to be a benchmark date in the midpoint of the tribulation where people during that time are going to be able to pinpoint where they're at by that event happening when the Antichrist breaks his covenant with Israel and does that abomination in the temple there. So uh, this, this happened during these times. And, and, and so we see the land being prepared. We see um, the people being prepared. We see all of those things. It, it, God is orchestrating all of that for the coming of the Savior. Then we talked about the Maccabees. Okay, then, then it's during this time, right around here, is the time of the Maccabees. That's 166 to 135. <clears throat> so th this time between here and there it would obviously be we're in, in this area here. Okay, so this was a Jewish rebellion against the Greeks, led by Mattathias and his son Judas, who would have been the more successful. <clears throat> Maccabee. All right, then, there, then, then a, a sort of royal family began to develop in, among the Jews, and they were called the Hasmodeans, and that was a Hasmodean dynasty. And these were the family of the Maccabees. It started under the reign of a, I think the grandson maybe of Mattathias, John Hyrcanus. You don't need to know that. But uh, suffice to say that it, there became a dynasty in Israel. Now we know that that wasn't to be the case because God was supposed to be their king. He was supposed to be their ruler. They weren't to have any other rulers. And so for somebody to create a dynasty, a, fam <coughs> excuse me, a family dynasty in Israel is not the will of God, was it, at all. But that, became, that came about. So the Hasmodeans, and not only that, but they began to link the priesthood with that ruler. And so uh, the people, like, like the Greeks and other people, and the Romans, of course, would try to put their rulers uh, into the priesthood. And so they infiltrated and uh, also were stained, I guess you could say, the priesthood by appointing people who were not of the priestly line into that position. So it became, it became uh, very, very corrupt. And uh, that's the Hasmodean dynasty. So that's six, six here. So I have it. Hasmodians, just like it says, Hasmodians. This is all happening during that time. Uh, the, now again, we can look back on there and make connections. When that happened, people were beginning to distrust the priesthood. Now, I'm going to explain to you why this is significant. The uh, Judaism, remember, revolt is centralized at the temple. The temple then, and the worship system at the temple was to be done by the priests. So if the priest didn't do it, then, then uh, there was no Judaism. If you didn't have a temple, you wouldn't have sacrifices. You don't have sacrifices, so you have to have the priesthood. Okay, so when this priesthood became tainted, and, and when, be, when the Jews began to distrust the priesthood, instead of the people <coughs> so much confiding in the temple worship and temple system, in comes the synagogues. Actually, this happened even way back up here. It's considered maybe the beginning of it. But it was in the synagogues where the Jews would learn their laws, where they would learn Hebrew. Hebrew is a language that was carried and was learned all the way through. I remember being in Israel, and we went through a, it was a, uh, it's not a monument, but it was a, like a museum. And it was the person that they actually call Messiah. It's this person of the Zionist movement, the latest Zionist movement. And they call, they believe he's a Messiah. Some people do, some Jews do. So they have this museum, and they have interviews kind of going over and over and over, of Holocaust victims. And so they're speaking there, and they're subtitled underneath there. And our guide said, what do you notice about, about this? That's all he said. He made a very generalization. What do you notice about this? <laughs> well, it's a TV, you know, what do you mean? And so he said, no, 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 no. He was waiting for something, and none of us got it. And he said, they're speaking Hebrew. And so we kind of like, so what? He's Jewish, he's speaking Hebrew, so what? The, the importance of that is this. Even though the Jews were persecuted, even though, um, and Hitler wasn't the only one, throughout time they did, one of, the thing that was, one of the things that was preserved, that the Jewish people preserved, was their language. That is an amazing thing if you think about it. They were taken out of their land. What, what, what nation has preserved the language when they're taken out of their land? Well, they did. And so they would go, they would, uh, 
they would have these uh, communities called kibbutz, is what they call them, and they would, they would uh, preserve their language and they would continue teaching their kids. Why is that? Because God gave us his word in that language in the Old Testament, and so they preserved it because God's word is preserved in that language. To me, that's an amazing thing. And uh, so the Hasmodeans, uh, this began to be corruption okay, in, in, in the priesthood. So people began to distrust it. So the synagogue began the place of, not worship necessarily, it began, the place, it, it began to come to the place where people confided in more. <clears throat> and so the people running the synagogue became rise to prominence. These would be the scribes and the Pharisees and the, and the doctors of the law. And they rose to prominence because of the corruption that was found here. Now, why is that important? What we see later on in the New Testament, of course, Paul, what was his method? He would go into the synagogue and he would teach there. So all of this, to me, was God's plan. It's really incredible when you think about it. We're just touching the surface of it all. And then the Romans. Of course, they ruled um, from, sorry, the Hasmoneans was 135 to 63. And, of course, uh, the Romans, uh, number seven, were, were from... 63 to whenever, to the time of Christ. Okay, so, which would be 4 BC. All right, so let's just go to 63 to 4. Obviously, they ruled past that time. We just want to come up to the birth of, of Christ. So, um, these silent years, not so silent when you look at it this way. Of course, God's word wasn't dispensed to people, but we have a very, very important and rich history that if you study the history of the silent years, with the, with the understanding that the New Testament was about to come. Then you begin to see connections. You begin to see how God was orchestrating things. So in comes the New Testament. Now why do we say this New Testament survey? Because we are about to study the New Testament. The very much part of God creating the church is Him giving the church His Word. And that's the New Testament. I've often thought, if a Jewish person would just read the New Testament, if they, would, if they just don't open their heart to it, but if they would just read the New Testament, so many connections will be made for them because it's all explained in the New Testament. It's all given to us, and we understand that. But uh, if they would just read it, and uh, they, they would know, and they would understand, and Christ gives us all of the answers right there. So that's his word, and he didn't leave us without a word, okay? And uh, we, we know it's his word. There were signs following. There's a lot I could say, tons I could say about the transmission of God's word through signs and wonders and things the apostles did. But at any rate, uh, that, that his word, the giving of his word, and the ushering in of the New Testament were coincidental. Okay? He gave us that New Testament, that part of his word. and that, that, uh, So we're living in what is called the New Testament era because God's word was dispensed for us during the apostolic period. Okay, so a lot of these th things will be in, in the book there. I may have added some or whatever, but uh, suffice to say for now, I just wanted to kind of get, get the ball rolling uh, for the New Testament, and I thought this was a good way to do it. Okay, remember, you can't... It's a historical. The Bible is a historical book. It is the historical book. And so you can't, it's hard to really get a full grasp of it unless you study this history. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see you next time. You're dismissed.